It's my pleasure to welcome you to the Clark Howard Show, where our mission is to serve you with knowledge so you are empowered to make better financial decisions in your life. And my first topic today is one of the things I'm so proud of at Clark.com are in-depth coverage of cell phone plans, including prepaid options. There are so many new plans out there. I want you to consider switching to save yourself giant dollars. Something else you can save a lot of money on that I've gotten a lot of strong pushback on over the years. If you need extensive dental work, having it outside the United States, I want to tell you what's going on with that. Again, I'm not a dentist. I can't tell you the quality of it, but I can tell you the dollar savings are enormous. And Clark stinks from Dennis. Well, I know they're coming. So I want to talk about how the cell phone industry is splitting in two directions at the same time. The market for cell phones is not growing like it used to. Not cell phone, the phone itself, but cell phone service. All the cell phone carriers are complaining how difficult it is for them to get new subscribers. So the big three are doing everything they can to push your bill higher and higher and higher. Um, AT&T and Verizon just raise rates. T-Mobile is under a legal provision that outlaws them raising rates on the plans that existed when they took over Sprint. It was part of the condition when they took over Sprint. So what they're doing is they're coming up with one new plan after another after another, trying to get you to migrate from the plan your grandfather and they can't raise rates on into a higher price plan. That's why anyone who's T-Mobile, you're getting these constant pitches from them to go to this other plan like the one they're pushing right now is where you can get an upgrade to your phone like willy-nilly by going into a much higher monthly rate plan. So there's nothing free about the free upgrade when you're paying a much higher price per month, right? So you got the big three who are trying to please their shareholders and pushing rates to the sky and at a time of marginal growth. And then at the same time, we now are at a point that we've got one in four American adults who have gone to discounters for cell phone service. The gap's getting larger and larger between the brand name companies, the big three, and everybody else and so this price gap is getting to be large enough that now over 70, somewhere like 75 million, something like that of Americans have gone to discounters because the savings are so incredible. And so you've got discounters that are owned fully by the big three to serve ultra price sensitive customers. And then there are independents out in the marketplace that offer a variety of rate plans that are ridiculously dirt cheap. But only those that are really, really price sensitive will leave the comfort of either of the brand name itself or a wholly owned part of that brand name. Um, one of the things that's happened recently is there's a lot of price activity inside Walmart. Walmart, for a sector of Americans, has always been the cell phone store. That's where people go. They buy a phone. They buy a plan from various companies that are either, in, in Walmart's case, very heavily. They've been, uh, with Verizon, selling plans owned by Verizon with various discount brands that Verizon uses as their names. And now AT&T is going into, with AT&T branded, both into Walmart and Target. I'm not jazzed about the price plans that AT&T is putting in the two discount stores. But then at the same time, AT&T owns Cricket. 
And Cricket is offering wonderful new rate plans based on your being loyal. And the way the new Cricket thing works is you can prepay three months, six months, or a year of service. As an example, if you pay Cricket $360, it covers your cell phone service, uh, supposedly unlimited data, for an entire year. You pay the 360, you're done. And so if you're comfortable with AT&T's network, great thing for you to do. Then uh, Visible, which I've talked about a lot, which is Verizon's uh, main discount brand, $25 a month and up, unlimited everything. And so these alternatives now, this is for one person. You don't have to have a family of four plan or anything like that. You just get the same cell phone service just much cheaper than you'd buy from the brand names you're so familiar with from TV ads that run every four seconds during a college football game. So these plans are what are known as prepaid versus postpaid. When you have a typical plan with Verizon, AT&T, or T-Mobile, you are being billed after the fact they're extending credit to you. With prepaid, you're paying in advance of the service for that month. In return for eliminating credit risk, the problem of having to collect money, not having to write off bad debt, you get much cheaper plans. And you should really look at our guide to these and reduce expenses. People are feeling so much pressure from inflation. And now, separate from inflation, feeling this pressure from the big three, pushing rates higher and higher and higher for services, they're actually costing them less and less to provide. And that's why you want to look at these alternatives that we have available for you. Krista? Okay, Christy in Georgia says, before Clark frowns at this question. Oh, that's quite a start. <laughs> We had our first baby born at the end of 2022. What? What am I? Am I Ebenezer Scrooge? I'm going to frown that you just had a baby? Congratulations. Yeah, exciting things going on. I had enough savings to cover the first two years to stay home with him, but I want to stay an additional year. My husband is a super retirement saver, but his savings account is non-existent. He's recently transferred one of his retirement accounts from a previous employer into a Roth IRA. This only holds around 20K, and we want to withdraw from it so I can stay at home this extra year. My question is, would we be able to withdraw the entire $20,000, or would the contributions be what was originally co contributed to the old company's 401K? I think she means the distributions be what was originally contributed to the old company's 401k. We have plenty of retirement funds and liquidating the smaller one will not do much to harm us in the long run. So there's a really funky rule that makes this really almost impossible to do without you paying tax penalties. The Congress anticipated that people might, with the very generous rules on withdrawal, and Roth IRAs, where you can withdraw your contributions tax and penalty free at any time, the people would say, okay, I got this old 401k, left that employer, I'm going to move that money over, and then I'm going to turn right around and withdraw my contributions. And so the feds make you wait five years in order to do that. So if your husband recently transferred the money from the 401k over to the Roth, it's been in there months not many years, you're five years away from being able to do that and not having it be an ugly taxable event. So I'm going to say something that um, I'm shocked I'm going to say. In this case, uh, you're a family that's really into saving money that you were able to save in advance enough money to cover two years of you staying at home. I'm not worried about you being frivolous with money as a couple. So in this case, I'm going to make an exception to normal advice. Borrow $20,000. Have your husband borrow $20,000 from his current employer's 401k plan. That will not be a taxable event. 
He'll have to make payments back slowly each month. And when you do go back to work in one year's time from now, then it'll all be about rebuilding the money for retirement. It would be good for you as a couple to have a rainy day fund as well, like you did anticipating having a child and building up two years reserve for you to be able to stay home with your now two-year-old. And so the Roth option does not apply in your case in this circumstance. Camille in Massachusetts says, I recently bought a house and also recently got engaged. Congratulations, congratulations. congratulations. We're in the preliminary stages of wedding planning, aka I said yes, and we've picked a date in the mid-2025. While we're excited to get married- Wow, that's a long time away. While we're excited to get married, the thought of saving for a wedding, assuming a $60,000 budget, paying for the mortgage, 3.8K monthly, anticipating home renovations, that totals to be determined, all while paying down credit card debt of $60,000 and undergrad and grad loans of 150K is extremely overwhelming. I'm overwhelmed and it's not me. (laughs) Wow. Since one partner makes 250K annually and the other makes 50K annually, should we elope this year for tax benefits, especially since it's the first full year of owning a home? And two, we planned a longer engagement so we could save more money, but how should we prioritize our home, paying off loans and credit card debt, and saving for the wedding? We definitely want to have a wedding, but we don't want to take a loan out to do so. Neither of our families are in a position to contribute financially. Thank you for any advice you have that can kickstart our journey to financial freedom on our path to I do. Aw, it's very romantic, that ending. Did you do that or did she do that? No, she did. That was Camille. That was, uh, That's Camille, all Camille. that was very nice. All right. So, Camille, uh, there's the big barn theory of finances. You got a big barn door with money coming in, uh, 300000 in income as a couple. That's a huge income. At the same time, the barn doors are open at the other end of the barn with money pouring out. Those were a lot of debts you listed. Um, 150,000 in student loans, mm-hmm. 60,000 in credit card debts. Um, uh, you got the mortgage, you've got improvements you're going to need to do to the house. Uh, gosh. And at the same time, 60,000 for a wedding is a giant amount of money for a wedding. And I think it's even been proven not just as a wise old tale, wives tale, whatever. I think it's been proven that the longevity of a marriage is inversely proportional to the cost of the wedding. So I'm all in favor of eloping and avoiding that expense. And then you have a party. You have a party to celebrate, which will be a whole lot less than the $60,000. And the pressures as a, a new couple Dealing with all those debts you've got, that's not good for a new marriage. So not throwing an additional 60000 into the pile of obligations would be a really great idea. Remember, the only thing that matters is that the person you're marrying is the person you're going to have so much joy spending your life with. That's what counts not how fancy a wedding is. So for Camille, you would say one, definitely don't, she wants to know what she should prioritize. Not the wedding, home improvements only if they're absolutely necessary, right? But until the credit card debt is zeroed out. Credit card debt, I mean, you pay the loans as agreed. The student loans. Yes, the interest rate on the student loans is far lower than the carry cost of those credit cards. You know, you have enough income as a couple you shouldn't be carrying $60,000 in credit card debt. You should be carrying $0 in credit card debt. So getting the finances in order is the highest priority that I have for the two of you. So you can have couples have so much angst together over money. You want to pull that out of the mix by not having the pressure of having all these debts. Tracy in Florida says, we live in Florida. Our oldest daughter lives in California, and we're about to have our youngest at college somewhere next year. 
If some catastrophic event occurred and cell phone communication was limited, how do you suggest staying connected while being so far away from one another? Satellite phones? Satellite phones, if, if we're in a uh, catastrophic environment and a foreign enemy likely has taken out cell phone networks, odds are they're going to hit other forms of communication like satellites. Satellites becoming so important as a uh, method of national defense, as part of national defense. So I don't know that's going to work. I, I know that um, Federal Emergency Management Agency talks about having a uh, relay system where if phones are down in one part of the country or something like that, cell phone networks, whatever it is, internet, that you have a relay where, where you can reach somebody, that's the go-to designee. Could be a, a sibling somewhere else in the country, aunt, uncle, uh, niece, nephew, uh, trusted friend, that in a situation where there is a national emergency of some kind, you have who you try to contact by whatever means is working, whether it is internet or who knows what. Um, I'm sure ham radio operators are saying, wait, why aren't you mentioning us? Because that is something that is a throwback, but is something that tends to work when nothing else does. So we adapt, we figure out ways, and it may not be immediate, but you will figure out a way to get it done. So um, you're not buying satellite phones. You have a daughter I'm, across I, the country. No, I don't have a sat phone. Uh, the sat phone thing, everybody's working on that as a capability that sits as a backup to the cell phone networks, and that, that will certainly happen. And there are these satellite devices you can buy that are standalone devices that you can send and receive text messages on them. You can't make phone calls, but you can send text. But again, that presupposes that the satellite networks are going to be working in a national emergency. But as was clear with all the stuff that came out in the Elon Musk um, biography that was just released, that when Elon Musk, uh, the facts are an argument, but Elon Musk prevented a Ukrainian attack on Russia, uh, on Russian assets, by pulling down their access to SpaceX at that time, because they were using SpaceX satellite technology to target Russian targets and pulled that down and prevented the attack to the benefit of Russia. These uh, satellite networks, communications networks of various types in a time of national emergency, particularly one that's defense-based, are at risk of various types. And yes, communication with each other is going to be something we're going to have to be very creative about when, like me and like you, we have family scattered all over the country. And that was a real downer Sorry. of a scenario to talk about, wasn't it? But, but that's good thinking, uh, good strategizing, and we will have suggestions from people. I'm sure. Ways to do this stuff. From the Clarksters. From the Clarksters. That's what we've settled on, the Clarksters? I guess. I guess. Till somebody you know, I love just, the Clark squad, but... The Clark. The Clarksters are part of the Clark squad. That's what I'm going to say. Overall, we're the Clark squad. Everybody we're listening, everybody watching. Of, we're all part of Team Clark. It's like we're Canadian. You know how they always <laughs> put the name of something front. Team Clark is here for you, and we are all members of Team Clark who contribute and assist to each other. Sounds great. I okay. love it. Coming up ahead, very controversial topic historically on our show, dental tourism. It's booming. We're going to talk why and what the risks are. Okay, I'm stepping right into it. I'm going to talk about dental tourism, which is something that people that live in uh, San Diego, Los Angeles, uh, Phoenix, Tucson, Albuquerque, have done this for decades where they cross the border into border towns, border communities, 
just across the border in Mexico and get significant dental work done at a fraction of the cost in the United States. So there's a new write-up Bloomberg did about how there are billboards along the interstates, along the southern southwestern tier, telling people, hey, come here for your dental work. Come there, blah, blah, blah. There's even a place referred to as Molar City, which has 350 dental offices at a border community that is near Yuma, Arizona. So it's accessible with a decent drive from across Southern California and the major pop centers of Arizona. And this little city in Mexico they refer to as the dental capital of the world, 350 different dental offices. And you see the US border as you walk into these offices, I mean, right at the border. Root canals, 250 bucks. Crown, 500 bucks. A filling, 50. But most of what people come for is more extensive dental work. Bloomberg talks about how Canadians are crossing the United States and going all the way to these dental offices across the US border in Mexico because it's so much cheaper. And they talk to people who, who face thousands and thousands of dollars in dental work that it's, they save at least half the cost by crossing to these dental offices right across the border. And this, this dental tourism has long been a very popular thing for expensive procedures and extensive procedures in Costa Rica. Americans from the eastern half of the United States, it's common, will fly to Costa Rica for extreme dental care and dental surgery. People go to Hungary. In Europe and Asia, people go to Hungary for the same reason because of a very large dental market at a tiny fraction of the cost of having dental care in their home countries. So the number of Americans who have no dental coverage at all is something about a quarter of the nation's population. And even if you have dental coverage, it's pretty minimal. Now, this is not something that I've run off to do, as cheap as I am. I have a dentist I've been going to for 20 plus years. I trust her, I trust her practice, and the bills are not cheap sometimes, but I have been willing to pay them. But what happens with so many people is the cost of dental care is so high they go without. And as any dentist will tell you, you neglect your teeth, it will then affect your overall health. And that's why deferring dental care is a lousy alternative. But if you got no money to afford the care where you live, this is an alternative. I am incapable, unqualified and incapable to tell you the quality of the care at this place or this place or this place or this place. I'm, I'm, I'm not qualified, and I recognize that. But I also have a responsibility to you to tell you that going without is not a good alternative. And if you will get work done, that potentially, that you would not get done otherwise because of the price difference, who am I to tell you that what the marketplace is speaking, that this has become such a big thing that so many Americans, Canadians, people around the world going to alternative places, alternative countries for dental care means that if you're facing a big expense that you keep putting off and off and off, you should consider these alternatives.
And for overall medical tourism, we do have an article at Clark.com that says is medical, it's called Is Medical Tourism Right for You? And that lists some agencies that you can check, you know, use to check on places you're thinking of going to. And that's for uh, medical, medical care, mainly. not dental. There is no equivalent that I've been able to find for dental care, uh, for medical, so many medical procedures that are life-saving, people don't get because they, even with health insurance, they can't afford them, and they go overseas for it. And that is a reality of the healthcare marketplace in the United States. We'll go to questions now. Carrie in Texas says, you always say those who pay off their credit cards in full each month are known as deadbeats by the credit card companies. Isn't it true that they're still making significant money off of every transaction a cardholder makes? Yeah, so the processing fees in the United States, the world's highest by far. And yes, there are, there are dollars flowing that are wonderful for the banks, not so good for the overall economy. And so that's why the credit card companies with their reward cards are seeking high volume chargers. If they have somebody who's charging enough dollars every month, they become profitable even if they're never paying a penny of interest. You are right. But they still prefer it for us to run balances and then pay the average 22% interest on those balances. Okay, Pete in Minnesota says, several years ago, we were with a financial company that recommended investing in REITs, R-E-I-T-S, real estate investment trust is that what it is okay about six years ago we switched to vanguard everything transferred over except the reits how can we get rid of them other than through a third party that offers about 40 cents on the dollar plus company buybacks happen infrequently we have three different reits what are reits what good are reits when you aren't able to cash them in whenever you need to so pete this is why i i like to buy reits indirectly through a reit index fund where you can buy a, a, a REIT ETF, index ETF, where you can buy and sell them as you wish. Uh, you were prior before you switched to Vanguard with an ultra high commission firm that is not a fiduciary. They were selling you what they would make the most commissions from. And the promoters of REITs pay massive commissions to these non-fiduciary commission-based salespeople who parade that they're giving financial advice that get you in these non-tradable REITs is one example. Uh, that They're all into, I should say this, the people who work at these non-fiduciary investment houses, including the bank-based ones, love selling uh, non-marketable securities. And these REITs are an equivalent. They do not trade on public exchanges where you can buy and sell at will. And that's how they have the money to provide the massive, ginormous commission. Isn't massive one of the words you told me I use too much? Or is it well, somebody one? on YouTube did say they were creating a drinking game where every time you say massive, they're going to take a drink. Oh, so let me use a different word. <laughs> Gigantic <laughs> commissions. <laughs> that are being charged. So now we can have a gigantic okay, yeah. drinking game. Okay. Anyway, um, the way they cover those gigantic commissions is by locking you in as a prisoner for a long time. It's kind of like how the insurance industry works with those hideous things. I'm sorry, family-oriented show. I'm going to use a cuss word. Those uh, variable and indexed annuities and all those horrible annuity products that have the gigantic commissions. <laughs> You are a prisoner for up to 15 years. Otherwise, you pay a very, very large, rather than say. Oh, you're about to say it. Yeah, I heard it. Very large surrender fees, which is kind of the equivalent you face with selling third party trying to get out of these REITs. Pete, as painful as it is, the least bad strategy is to stay in the REITs till they roll out, roll off, till the normal redemption period where you would not lose 40% of your money. The important thing that 
your question provides to other people is how key it is to not be with non-fiduciary investment providers because you may think you're getting advice for free. It's the most expensive advice you could ever receive because you're going to get ripped off with beep <laughs> commissions and fees. <laughs> Ryan in Tennessee says, I'm 33 and have two children, three and one. My current investment advisor recommends one 529 account for simplicity of managing it and changing the beneficiary as withdrawals are necessary. With the 2024 tax law change of converting unused funds over to Roth IRAs, we plan to use the 529 account as a vehicle to both save for college and jumpstart our ch children's retirement savings. Do you recommend one 529 account for each child? Yeah, yes, Ryan. I I hope that there was just a misunderstanding in what you heard from the advisor. I have never, ever heard an advisor recommend a single 529 account with the intended purpose of being for more than one child. That is not, uh, I don't want to say it's lame advice. It's not standard. Let's leave it at that. And hopefully you're not buying it through the advisor that right. they're telling you to go to the state directly. Yeah, you never, never, ever not ever, without exception, never buy a 529 account through a human being. You only buy direct, direct sold 529 accounts, no commissions, and the overall ongoing expenses far, far, far lower. To know how to do this, I have a briefing at Clark.com clark.com slash 529 you'll see the good plans we review them and and rate them in terms of quality once a year oh, the only ones you should even consider are the ones that are on our top list never buy a 529 plan never involving a salesman salesperson because the commissions are so bad See, I used a different word than that beep word. And the advice to have one plan for two children, uh-uh. One plan for each child you own, they're the beneficiary, and you are right. Starting in a few months, 529s will be activated where if you hold them long enough and money in them goes unused, it is a tax-free transfer of wealth from one generation to another with the excess funds up to, as today's law stands, $35,000 max can be put in over time that will can be moved from a 529 plan to a Roth. It is a fantastic thing because people have been under saving in 529 plans because they're worried kid doesn't go to college, kid gets scholarships, uh, Kid doesn't need all that money for whatever reason at college. They In the military, they got benefits, whatever. Now you don't have to worry about those what-ifs. At least up to $35,000 can then migrate into a retirement account tax-free, a retirement account that then grows and is spent tax-free decades, decades later in a Roth IRA. It's fantastic. And I want to thank you so much for joining us today. I hope there's something you heard in today's episode that you can act on in your life, that you can make a difference in your financial situation, financial security, or move you closer to the path of financial independence. If you found something useful or you find what we do useful, please share it with a friend or a family member that you like so they can benefit from the financial advice, the guidance, and the information. And I hope you have an absolutely great day.